be sitting there today saying, John, I understand what you're saying. I feel like the chisel is falling on me over and over and over and it hurts. And I understand that it hurts because we're in the teeth of it right now as our family. But I want to encourage you to see that God is shaping you into something new. And as C.S. Lewis said, this is a gift of something, a gift of this, this suffering is a gift because God wants to do something in you to prepare you for something later. There is a reason for your pain. If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Candidly, one of the most kind of discouraging and defeating phrases uh, that I can think to myself is this question here. It's, what's the point? People come to me and say, John, what's the point? I just don't see the purpose. Maybe it's in their marriage or maybe it's in their finances, or maybe it's even spiritually. They say, John, what's the, the point in church at all? I just don't see the purpose behind it. I just don't think it's worth it. I'm exhausted. Why should I keep trying? Why should I keep praying when it seems to do nothing? Nothing seems to change. Why should I continue to do what's right when it doesn't seem to matter or make a difference? And maybe you're here this morning, and you say, yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. What's, what's the point? What's the purpose to any of this? Well, hopefully in our time this morning, we're going to all come together to see that today there is a reason, there is a reason for whatever you're going through. You know, I've heard it said that people hate pain. Raise your hand if you'd say, yeah, John, I agree with that. I hate pain. If you're watching online, put it in the chat. I hate pain. I I would argue that that's not completely true. I don't think that that's totally accurate. I don't think that people hate pain. What I think is that people hate pain without a purpose, People hate pain when there's no purpose. For example, uh, when something bad happens and you can't see a reason behind it, maybe you're in a car accident and someone's injured, or maybe your spouse cheats on you, or maybe you lose your job, or maybe you find yourself battling cancer, or you lose your loved one to an illness. You say, you know, I'm left with this pain without purpose. And you're left asking this question, why is this happening? Where is God in the midst of my pain? I've been a good person. I read my Bible, I go to church, I even serve at church. What's the purpose in what I'm going through? This isn't fair. I would argue that people don't hate pain. What they hate is pain without a purpose. Because the truth is is that people can endure a lot of pain if they think that there is a purpose behind it. And I think it's kind of funny that people will actually pay a lot of money to endure pain. People will pay a lot of money to run in a marathon. They'll pay good money to enter uh, the New York City Marathon or the Boston Marathon, and they'll pay good money to buy all the, you know, expensive shoes and necessary clothes to run in a marathon. Now, I've never run in a marathon, but I would imagine at mile eight, nine, or 10, you start to experience some pain, and you still have 16 more miles to go. But they would tell you that that pain is worth it because of the payoff, because at the end of that race, when they cross the finish line, they have this sense of satisfaction and this sense of accomplishment. So the pain was worth it because of the payoff. I would imagine if you found some recovered drug addicts or recovered alcoholics, they would tell you that the pain from withdrawal, they would tell you that the pain from detoxing from the chemicals that had held them bondage for years, it was terrible. It was horrible, but they would tell you that the gift of sobriety that they're now experiencing is worth it. The pain was worth it because of the payoff. I think about my wife who gave birth to our two children. And for our first son, Colton, she was in labor for 30 hours, 30 hours experiencing incredible pain. And that doesn't even count the nine plus months that she was pregnant before that moment. But she would tell you if she was here today that it was worth it. That 30 hours of intense pain was worth it once she was able to hold our firstborn son, Colton, in her arms. I think that people don't mind pain if there is a purpose. And maybe you're here today and you're going through a season of pain. You're going through a season of hurt and frustration and uncertainty. What I hope that we can all see together is this. There's a point to your pain. There is a point to your pain. Let's pray. Father, we ask that through the truth and the power of your word, And through the goodness of your grace and your mercy and out of your love for us, God, that this morning we would see that there's a point to our pain, that there's a point to our suffering. God, open our eyes to receive this truth today. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, there's this verse 
uh, that used to really bother me. It used to actually kind of confuse me. I don't know if that's legal to say as a pastor that there are Bible verses that bothered me, but there was this verse that bothered me until recently, and it's this conversation between Jesus and Simon. This guy Simon in the New Testament, his name was changed to Peter, so he's called Simon, he's called Simon Peter, he's called Peter. It's all three the same person. But Jesus is having this conversation with Peter, and it used to really bother me. It's in Luke chapter 22, and it says this. Jesus says to Simon, 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 Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. So Jesus is saying, Simon, the devil has asked permission to put you through a series of trials. And it's important for us to stop there and recognize that nothing comes to you unless it first comes through Jesus. Okay, so that's important for us to realize. He says, Simon, the devil has come to me and asked permission to sift you as wheat. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through testing. It's going to hurt. He could have said, Simon, you're going to be embarrassed. You're going to be humiliated. You're going to be ashamed. This is going to be harder than you could ever imagine. And he goes on, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And this bothered me because the devil comes to Jesus and he asks permission to hurt Simon, to put him through this series of trials. And Jesus is just going to let it happen. And he says, I'll pray for you, Simon. I don't know about you, but if I was in Simon's shoes in this moment, I would say, hey, Jesus, why don't you just skip the whole prayer part and just run the devil out of town? I know you got the power to do that. Why don't you just go ahead and do that? But he doesn't do that. He goes along with whatever Jesus is saying here, and uh, he realizes that something big is about to come to him. And it's really important for us to see what Jesus doesn't say to Simon here. Jesus doesn't say to Simon, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your bank account will stay in the positive through this tough season. He doesn't say to him, Simon, I prayed for you that your stock portfolio would grow during this time. He doesn't say, Simon, I prayed for you that your, uh, you would gain social media followers or that your influence on social media would expand. What he says is, Simon, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And we have to understand, as followers of Jesus, that is the number one objective from the enemy. It's not our finances, it's not our relationships, it's not our influence, it is our faith. He may use that as a means to accomplish his ends, but his end game is he wants to see our faith crumble. He wants to see our faith fail. Have you ever felt like Simon? Have you ever felt like you were under attack, that for some reason, unknown to you, that Jesus has given permission to the enemy to sift you as wheat? My family actually feels like that right now. Let me tell you a little bit of our story. This is a picture of us on August the 3rd. We were at Disneyland. We were in the happiest place on earth. We were filled with joy and bliss and churros and ice cream and popcorn. Uh, We were in the happiest place on earth, and we were completely unaware, completely oblivious to what was about to happen to our family because this is our family now. This is my son, Declan, my wife, Valerie, and my son, Colton. In late July, my wife discovered a lump, and we really didn't think much of it. You know, thought it was just, you know, something that we needed to get checked out. No big deal. We would get over it quickly. So she went to her primary care physician, and they said, yeah, there's something there. You should probably go and get a mammogram, an ultrasound, and they'll take care of it. Probably no big deal. No fear on our part. We thought everything was going to be fine. So we went had the mammogram, ultrasound. They said, yeah, you need to get this thing biopsy. There's definitely something happening there. We go into the clinic for the biopsy. There are signs everywhere that say 80% of people who have a biopsy don't have cancer. So again, we just thought, hey, the odds are in our favor. We're good. We're going to get this over with. We're going to be free and clear. So on a Friday morning, we went in. She had her biopsy, and we knew that it was going to take a few days to get the test results back. So Tuesday morning, I'm actually upstairs in our conference room in a staff meeting, and my wife, who works here in the finance department, Valerie texts me, and she says, hey, John, can you come out and talk to me? So I walked out of our staff meeting, and she had this big smile on her face. And she said, hey, I just talked to the doctor's office, and they told me that I'm free and clear that I don't have cancer. And I was like, well, of course you don't. We knew you didn't. The odds were in our favor. Everything was going to be fine. So I gave her a hug, and I went back to our staff meeting. And then a few hours later, at noon, I had just eaten lunch, and I was in the the kitchen upstairs and I was washing a dish and I turned around and my wife is standing behind me and her face is flooded with tears and she could barely get the words out that she actually did have cancer because what happened was the person that she talked to in the morning read the wrong chart and was reading someone else's results, not ours. So on August the 30th, we found out that my wife was diagnosed with a very aggressive form, fast-growing form of 
breast cancer. And in that moment, our sifting season began. About 10 days later, it was a Wednesday morning, I was here at church, and my phone rang. And it was my wife. She had just dropped our son Colton off from school. Again, this is just 10 days removed from her cancer diagnosis. And she pulled out on 290 and she was T-boned by someone going 55 miles per hour. And our car was totaled. She was injured. Our sifting season continued. A week later, 8.30 in the morning, I'm upstairs. My phone rings. I look down. It's my wife's number. But when I answered the phone, it wasn't my wife's voice. I heard it was my son's voice, Colton. And he says, Colton, or he says, Dad, um, the uh, ambulance is here. Mom's fainted and they're taking her to the emergency room. And so what happened, there was something going on with her heart. My son was eating breakfast at the kitchen uh, counter. My wife stumbled out and all she could get out was call 911. And she fell on her face on her tile floor, sprained her hand, cracked her jaw on her head on the, the tile floor. And that night I sat with my son and he said, Dad, I thought I watched mom die this morning. And our sifting season continued. She began chemo treatments. She's two treatments in, and the sickness took over her body. She was so weak that she could no longer walk across the house without having to sit down after taking about 10 steps to rest. And a few weeks ago, I sat with my boys in the bathroom, and I shaved my wife's head. You think it's not a big deal, but it is. I thought back to when I was 23 years old, and I stood at the aisle marrying my wife and never thought that the day would come or I'm sitting with my two sons in the bathroom and they're in tears and I'm in tears and she's in tears and she feels this shame and this loss of dignity for this thing as, as a woman that gives you a lot of value. She had this beautiful red hair and our sifting season continued. There's this picture of our couch in our living room and what's so interesting about this is we have a lot of family memories and moments on this couch. On August the 1st, 48 hours before that picture of us at Disneyland was taken, we, we set our sons on that couch and we said, hey, we have this surprise for you guys, this thing that we've been keeping from you for a few months, we're going to go to Disneyland. Just a few weeks later, we set them on that same couch on August the 30th and said, boys, we have a, a surprise for you. It's a different kind of surprise, but your mom has cancer. We don't know how this story is going to play out. We don't know what the end of this story will look like, but we know that we're in it together and our sifting season continued. So what we're learning in the midst of this journey, and if you find yourself in a season where you feel like you're being sifted, is that whenever the devil is attacking you, when you feel like you are being tested, remember that pain is a part of God's plan to prepare you for your purpose. Pain is a part of God's plan to prepare you for your purpose. God is doing something in you now to prepare you for something later. Pain is a part of God's plan to prepare you for your purpose. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. Look at what he said. He said, I suggest to you that it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. The gift of suffering. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. He goes on to say this. You see, we are like blocks of stone out of which the sculptor carves the forms of men. The blows of his chisel which hurt us so much are what make us Perfect. And you may be sitting there today saying, John, I understand what you're saying. I feel like the chisel is falling on me over and over and over and it hurts. And I understand that it hurts because we're in the teeth of it right now as our family. But I want to encourage you to see that God is shaping you into something new. And as C.S. Lewis said, this is a gift of something. A gift of this, this suffering is a gift because God wants to do something in you to prepare you for something later. There is a reason for your pain. I like to look at Simon Peter because he makes me feel really, really good about myself. This is the guy that just cannot get anything right. How many of you keep a friend around like Peter? Yeah, no matter how dumb you are or the stupid things you do, they always do something dumber or more stupid than you. If you would say, I don't have a friend like that, that probably means you are that friend to someone else. So just be aware of that. But I just want to kind of look at the high points of some of Peter's incredible failures. Let's just look at a couple of them. In Matthew 16, Jesus sits down with his disciples and he kind of unveils his master plan. He says, this is why the father has sent me. He said, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna give my life and then I'm gonna be raised from the dead in three days. And Simon, Peter stands up and he says, no, you can't do this. He rebukes Jesus. And Jesus calls Peter a stumbling block and he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, I went to seminary for a long time, and this is something you can only learn in seminary. So I'm going to give you some seminary knowledge here that you would never learn at church. You can only learn at seminary. It takes like eight years to learn this. You ready? 
whenever Jesus calls you Satan, that's not a good thing, okay? <laughs> so take that home, impress your friends with that knowledge. It's important for you to know. But he, tell, he calls him Satan because Simon has messed up so much here in this moment. Later on, Jesus takes the disciples to the garden right before he is about to be arrested and go to the cross. And he goes to Peter and he says, I need you to stay awake. I need you, I need you to keep guard. I'm going to go off and pray. Jesus goes off and he prays and he comes back. And what's Simon doing? He's sleeping. He's sawing logs. He couldn't even stay awake for a few, few hours to do the small task that Jesus asks him to do. And then there's this kind of funny scene. Again, this is all a part of the plan that Jesus told the disciples that would happen. The Roman guards show up to arrest Jesus so he can fulfill his mission. And Simon, in this moment of bravery, jumps up, grabs the sword, swings for the neck of one of the Roman soldiers, and can't even do that right because he cuts his ear off. And his ear falls off and rolls away. And Jesus, in this funny scene, says, somebody find the ear. And it's like rolled under a bush. And so they have to go looking for this ear. And he heals him, puts it back on. He can't even do that right. But then there's this really dramatic moment in Luke 22, where Jesus tells Simon something that Simon just can't believe. He says, Simon, you're going to deny me three times before tomorrow morning. And Peter says, no way. I, I love you. You know, I followed you for three years. There's no way that you're going to do this. And he was right. There's this little girl that comes to him and says, hey, aren't you one of the disciples that follows this Jesus guy? And Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. And then someone else asks him the same question and he denies him again. And on the third time, there's this stunning scene where at the third time that Peter denied Jesus, just as Jesus said he would do, the Bible says that their eyes locked, that Jesus and Simon looked eye to eye. Luke 22, it says, the Lord, Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Peter's thinking, this pain is more than I can bear. I'm such a failure. I can't believe I've let Jesus down. I haven't lived up to my potential. And as hard as it was for Peter to see in this moment, and as hard and as difficult as it may be for you to see today, there was a purpose in his pain. And we're going to see it unfold in here in just a minute. But pain is a part of God's plan to prepare you for your purpose. That's why I tell myself this. Don't look at your circumstance through the lens of pain. Don't look at your circumstance. Don't look at this season of suffering through the lens of pain because it's so easy to do to say, you know, here's what I've lost or here's what hurts so much or here's what I was going to do or here's where we were going to go or here's how much money I had planned to be in my bank account. This is not fair. Don't look at your circumstance through the lens of pain. Instead, look at your pain through the lens of purpose. Look at your pain through the lens of purpose and realize that God may be doing something in you before he's going to do something through you. St. Therese of Lisieux is one of my favorite characters outside of the Bible who was a Christ follower. And she said this, this is amazing. Sufferings gladly born for others convert more people than sermons. And she's speaking from experience here. She lost her mother at the age of four. She, was, she endured extreme bullying her entire school life. She lost her adopted mother at the age of nine. Late in her teen years, she contracted a rare form of tuberculosis, and she ended up dying from that tuberculosis at the age of 24. But what she wanted people to see was in her suffering, in her tuberculosis, and losing two mothers, and the bullying that she experienced, she gladly bore them for others so that they would see Jesus in her life. And when you gladly bear your sufferings, people see Jesus. They see a faith that works, and it makes them interested and curious of how can you go through such a difficult time and still have so much joy, so much meaning, so much purpose. And like she says, it converts more people than sermons. If people see you suffer well and suffer for a purpose, they're going to be more interested in following Jesus than any message that I could ever give. Our suffering allows other people to see Jesus. And this has been one of the most frustrating things for me with my wife, Valerie, going through cancer. Because if you've ever met Valerie, you know she is a ray of light in any room that she enters. She's so positive. She's so optimistic. People on staff here would say that she's the polar opposite of who I am. She's just incredible in every single way. And she will be so sick that she will have spent hours in the bathroom sick from chemo. She'd be so sick that she can barely walk from our living room from our bedroom to our living room without having to stop, lean up against the wall, take a seat so that she doesn't faint because she's so winded out of breath from the chemo treatment. But somebody can call her and ask her how she's doing and complain of a paper cut 
and she'll light up and she'll act that what they're going through is the most difficult thing in the world and she'll be filled with so much joy and people are so moved from it. And I'm like, Valerie, people don't know how sick you are because you're so joyful and you're so glad and you're so positive. You need to let them know how sick you truly are. But she's living out exactly what St. Therese here sees. And people, friends, family members that we've never had spiritual conversations with are now interested in Jesus because of the way they see Valerie carrying her cross of suffering right now. This is why Paul could write in Romans 8, 28. Yeah, you can clap for that. Clap for Valerie. It's a verse we've heard. You know, if we've grown up in the church, if you haven't grown up in the church, you've probably seen it on a pillow or on a coffee mug. Romans 8, 28. This is how Paul can say this. He says, and we know that in all things, everyone say all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose in all things. So in the proposal or in the breakup, and in the employment or being fired, in pregnancy or in miscarriage, in health or in cancer, God works in all things for the good, according to his purpose, not according to your pain. So you have to choose to see your circumstance, choose to see your pain through the lens of purpose. But you may say, John, you have no idea how much I hurt. You have no idea how difficult the season in my life is. And I understand that that may be true, but that very thing that you dreaded that's come into your life may be the thing that God's using to develop you, to develop you into something that can be used later for his purpose. Because oftentimes, the bigger the pain we're experiencing, the bigger the purpose that God has for us in the future. This is why James can write in James chapter one, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The pain the trial, the suffering, the heartache that you're going through, that my family is going through right now is doing something. It's producing per perseverance. It is there for a reason. God has a purpose for your pain. Not all storms come to disrupt our life. Some come to clear our path. We just have to trust that God has a plan, that pain is a part of God's plan to prepare you for your purpose. Let's go back to this conversation that Jesus was having with Simon in Luke 22 and see how it ends. He says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew that Peter was gonna fail. Jesus knew that Peter was gonna doubt, that he was gonna cower, that he was gonna deny Jesus. But he also knew that Peter was gonna turn back and that when he turned back, he was gonna be stronger than he was before. Because this was all of God, part of God's plan to develop Peter for his purpose. He knew that he would turn back and that he would be stronger than he was before. And this was all preparation for him to speak at Pentecost where he could get up in front of people and he could preach repentance because he knew what it was like to be forgiven. So he stood up and he preached repentance about a God that would welcome the believer back with open arms, that there was no sin too great to be forgiven. He could preach from a place of experience and 3,000 people could give their life that day because there was purpose in his pain. And if I'm being honest with you, I don't always see it day by day. When I watch my wife struggle the way that she struggles, and the pain that she has through this sickness, sickness and as this chemo ravages her body, I don't always see the purpose. I don't always see God's plan, but I choose by faith to believe it. I choose to believe that like Peter, one day we're gonna turn back and God's gonna use this to strengthen us and that we will be able to strengthen others because of the story that God has given to us. And this is part of God's plan to prepare us for the purpose. And God has that same plan for you today. Let's go back to this picture of this couch. You know, we have a lot of great family memories here on this couch. And I know that there are going to be more in the future. 
But when we're in seasons of pain, it's so easy to look at our pain as a snapshot. It would be so easy for me to see that couch every time I walk in the house and my mind only go to August 30th, to the day I set our sons down and told them that their mom had cancer. It would be so easy. And if I did that, I would miss it. I would miss God's plan. But what I believe is gonna happen is I believe that a year from now, after Valerie has surgery, after she has almost another year of chemo and radiation and hormone therapy and who knows what else, maybe it's in two years, maybe it's in three years, we're gonna look back at this moment, this snapshot, and all along the way from August 30th to whatever year it is at that point, we're gonna see God's faithfulness and we're gonna say, there it is, there it is. God had a purpose in this. God had a purpose in our pain. And if we isolate it to just that moment, we miss it. And it's so easy to get mired down, bogged down in our pain in this moment. But we have to step back and not choose, and choose not to see our circumstance through the lens of pain, but through the lens of purpose, because God has a plan for you. As we end, I want to go back to one of the earliest stories in the Bible. It's actually Genesis 35, and it's about Jacob and Rachel. And uh, Rachel was Jacob's wife. And they're actually on this road to Bethlehem. And look at what happens here. Genesis 35, verse 16. It says, Then they moved on from Bethel while they were still some, different, di some distance from Ephrath. Now, Ephrath is the Old Testament name for the New Testament city, Bethlehem. So Ephrath is Bethlehem. So they're on this road to Bethlehem. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying. She named her son Ben-Onai, but his father named him Benjamin. Now, why is this important? The name Ben-Onai means son of my trouble or son of my sorrow. Rachel's naming her son after her experience. She was giving her son name in this moment based on her experience. But Jacob, his father, whose name had just been changed to Israel, chose not to name his son according to his experience. He chose not to name his son according to his name, but to his pain, but he chose to name him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And in the Bible, the right hand is the place of power, of favor, of blessing and authority. And in this moment, you have to know that Jacob was going through incredible pain as his wife was passing away. But he said, I'm not going to name my son. I'm not going to be, tie my son down to this moment of sorrow and pain, but I'm going to name him after the blessing that I believe is going to come into his life in the future. Rachel was buried in Bethlehem as the scripture teaches us. But the prophet Micah said that out of Bethlehem would come a ruler, the Messiah. Jesus, who would crush the head of the enemy, who, has, who at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Do we know Bethlehem better by what was buried there or what was born there? The question for us today in our season of suffering or in our moment of pain is this. Will I remember this season of pain because of what was buried or because of what was born? If you're going through a season of pain, will you remember it based on what you lost? Or maybe the hopes and the dreams that you saw fade away? Will you remember it based on what relationship died? Or will you remember it based on what was born? This new purpose, this new plan that God has given you. Sometimes pain is a part of God's plan to prepare you for your purpose. Don't bury your blessing. Find the purpose in your pain. Out of this great pain could come God's greatest purpose in your life. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. And we hope and pray that this message touched your heart. And we wanna hear from you. We want to get to know you. There are several links below this video that you can connect and let us know what's going on in your life. So we would love to invite you to do that. But most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, that is amazing and we want to celebrate you. I invite you to text next steps to 22999. We'll respond with a text and give you some resources and next steps for your faith journey. So we just celebrate you and want to uh, invite you to do that. Thank you so much for making this decision to follow Jesus. It's amazing. So thank you again for being a part of our service today. We will see you next time. 
If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.